Thank you very much for joining uh, us for this session where we are going to talk about HR board reports. I do know that a number of us uh, do have uh, an opportunity uh, as you work in HR to prepare an HR board report one way or the other. What I'm going to be giving you today is just the highlights uh, of what you can do and what you need to do. If you need help, then we can then engage outside this particular presentation in terms of how you can prepare your board reports, especially that how to set it up so that it can start running uh, in terms of how you prepare your HR board report. And that is very crucial for you to be able to do that. Once the templates have been set by the team that is here, it's much easier. If you've got an automated system in terms of your data, it becomes much easier for you to, to actually run with these uh, HR board reports. So today I'm speaking from a very high level kind of uh, issues that we need to, to, to address. So what, will be, what we will be covering, uh, we'll be covering issues to do with the relationship between HRI indicators and business performance, because that's the backbone of any HRI board report, then selecting the right indicators, uh, interpreting HRI indicators for the benefits of the business, then the reporting levels. At the end, I'll just show you a sample a board report uh, that uh, it's still not yet complete, but some of the things that you can expect to see if you are doing it right. Uh, my experience is that a number of people actually don't do it correctly uh, for various reasons, either lack of capacity to prepare the reports or the board members don't care about what comes to them. So, and also uh, subsequently, they don't give any particular attention uh, to what you present to them. Those are challenges that you need to, to deal with. Uh, so, when you look at the HR board report, or uh, the HR report in general, uh, it has got many customers or consumers who, are, who can actually benefit from it. Uh, globally, you will notice that uh, the board will be interested in HR indicators or report. Investors, uh, especially just before a due diligence starts, they also may uh, ask for an HR report. Uh, then you also get regulators who may require an HR report. Customers, in some instances, before they actually contract you to provide them with a service, they may require you to provide an HR report. Then potential employees uh, sometimes also need to find out what is happening in terms of HR. So that those are the, some of the, the, the customers or the stakeholders who are interested in getting this kind of information. But you must also remember that uh, there is no agreed framework in terms of how HR should be reporting, except a, a few countries that have actually taken steps to be able to uh, uh, standardize this and, and uh, give guidance in terms of how this should be done. Okay, so where is the, uh, where, where, where is the, the, the problem? Uh, and why do we need it? Why do we need the HR board report? The first one is that uh, uh, the board definitely will require an HR board report in order for you to provide them with insights uh, into how HR practices are effective or creating value for the business. So in summary, the HR board report is required to show the board and other key stakeholders how HR is a function in the organization is actually creating, uh, creating a value for the organization. That's the key question. And you don't, as we go through this, you need to remember uh, this key question. How is HR creating value for the organization? And how is that done? That, that, that's crucial for you to, to take note of that. Uh, and that the, the key question that everyone would need to answer. How can we show that HR within our, fun, within our organization is actually creating value for the organization? Uh, that is very crucial. Let's look at some of the challenges uh, 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 and, and what you need to know as an HR professional and some of the challenges that I have encountered and also generally expressed by uh, board members as well across uh, uh, um, sectors, not necessarily here, but uh, in other countries as well. Uh, uh, so an HR professional, for them to be able to give value and to create uh, this kind of valuable report, they need to a very high understanding of how the business makes money. And that is key for the business. Uh, you also need to have an understanding of what the business needs to do in order to grow. Uh, basically, how, how can we grow our market share as a business? Uh, HR should be in the thick of things in terms of how you're helping the organization to grow. Uh, HR should be in the thick of things in terms of how the business is making money. Then the key lead person, uh, uh, there must also be a key lead person in driving the formulation and the implementation of strategy. I remember some time back when I was still in, uh, not out of consulting, uh, I took this initiative. I was basically gave myself this kind of charge where I was in charge of strategy, formulation, and implementation. And that is a key part of HR that they often neglect. 
they leave it to the CEO or some other department to be able to do that. But I believe that uh, Asia can actually uh, play a big part in strategy formulation and implementation. And once you get a person who understands how the business makes money, a person who understands how they can help to grow the business, a person who understands strategy in terms of how they can formulate and implement the, implement the business strategy, uh, it's much easier for that individual to be able to add value through these reports. Why, bo why are boards sometimes uh, not reading or not taking area channel reports seriously? Uh, here are the reasons that I have picked also from written uh, literature as well as my own experience. Uh, sometimes when you read some of the HR reports, there's nothing material that impacts the business that is reported by HR in the most of the cases. And it's purely an administrative report. This is why you find sometimes uh, uh, board members cruise through an HR committee meeting or, or they cruise through any reporting that comes from HR because they know there's nothing of value that comes out of it or there's no risk really that can be highlighted from HR. Uh, and uh, I'm sure some of you, you may have experienced a situation where your reports are not read, uh, people cruise through them, they don't pay attention to them. These are all indications of how the report is prepared. If you prepare it properly, everyone would want to read that report. Probably everyone would look, look forward to reading that report because of the value that they will get generate from that. HR professionals who take administrative and trivial issues to the board can also contribute towards the board not paying attention to this. Sometimes you find that uh, the, the HR, when they go to the board, their main focus is salary and benefits. Every board meeting, the focus is salaries and benefits. And once you start doing that, uh, the board will not take it seriously because they think you have no, nothing else besides being an advocate of salary adjustment for employees, which is not your role, basically. Your role is much more broader and strategic than, than just taking the, and taking a salary request, salary increase request. Then you also find that HR professionals present purely HR data with no connection to business impact. All these factors, from my own assessment, are contributing to people not taking you seriously. They may not tell you, they may just read your report and pass through it, nothing comes out of it. And when you start introducing something of value with no supporting data, they get very confused and they don't pass anything or they postpone. They, then the other challenge that HR people face is that a board with no interest in HR can be also a stumbling block in most cases. And an HR committee with very little understanding of HR issues, which is basically what you have found uh, if you look at research locally, that uh, most of the HR committees are chaired by people who have no HR experience at all, or most of the HR committees have no single person with HR experience. These are all concerns that can lead to some of the fatigue and lack of interest that we find in many of these uh, uh, HR board reports. So that's the challenge that we, that, we, that we find in many organizations. And you need to deal with these issues. But I think one of the ways to deal with this issue is basically to be able to present credible, uh, actionable information to the board, and they will listen uh, if you do that. So let's look at why report on HR data. Uh, why is it that we need to report in HR data to the board? Uh, basically to demonstrate the value of HR to the business. That's, that's the key element as I highlighted at the beginning. When you are reporting to the board, you are demonstrating the value of HR to the business and how HR can play a part in enabling uh, the stakeholders, to, uh, key stakeholders to make informed decisions, especially how HR can impact on the, the, the business. And this report must both provide quantitative and quantitative data. It doesn't necessarily follow that the, if the report is uh, as quantitative, it's better. No, it depends on what you are presenting. Uh, the report can both be quantitative and qualitative, although we find that most of the time uh, the challenge is on the, the HR people uh, understanding the quantitative uh, aspects. It is also important to note that the, the, content, uh, uh, the content and formats differ across organizations. In some instances, you find that individual organizational context do, does matter actually and should never be ignored. You don't necessarily have to copy a report from another organization. They, they may be reporting on things that are of, of no value to your own organization. So you need to stick to what is important. Uh, just list the top priorities for your business from an HR point of view and these must be linked uh, 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 to your business as an organization. Uh, and also be careful that you don't report on everything. Uh, it's very important to distinguish between a report that is a report for HR function, which is presented internally uh, to the other management team or internally to the HR team. Those reports are completely different. But when you start going to the board, uh, you are now going into a more rarefied and more refined kind of reporting that is required as you go up 
uh, to the organization. So there, there is a huge difference there that you need to, 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 to take note of. In other countries like the UK, US, uh, they are more advanced in terms of uh, uh, preparing these reports and the regulators themselves have actually come up with some form of requirements for, 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 for organization to report to the regulators and investors. So UK and the US, they have made uh, serious strides in terms of making sure that they are standardized reports uh, on HR. The biggest challenge currently though is that uh, there is no agreed framework in terms of how this should be done. There are several initiatives uh, underway. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, Steve Hunt, we did bring Steve Hunt uh, uh, on one of our presentations last year, uh, what he noticed that he sometimes, because of fear of quantitative uh, methods to, of putting this data together, sometimes HR people uh, are a bit lethargic in terms of how they approach this. But uh, as I have emphasized several times, HR people don't necessarily need to be mathematical. They need to get people, other people to do it for them. That's why you find a number of organizations are actually looking for someone, probably the statistics background or operation research to work in HR so that they can prepare these reports for them. They come in as a graduate trainee. This is not complicated and you don't necessarily have to understand all the mathematics required in some of the calculations. You just need to get someone to employ someone who will add value because when they come in they add value immediately and a number of progressive organizations have already gone or are already underway in terms of this particular path then uh, one of the key challenges that we uh, probably will confess that people have struggled in HR is to isolate the contribution of people or people practice from other factors in the business for example if sales go up can, uh, can you go and say it's because of HR if certain business outcomes increase or are in a positive range, can you go and say this is because of HR? The challenge is separating those issues uh, to do with uh, HR and those issues that are outside HR. For example, uh, things can go up and down because of economic situation. Things can go up and down because of market forces. Sometimes things can go up and down because of financial resources and customer or social trends, which have nothing to do with the HR. You can't then go there and claim that HR, these things are going up because of, of an HR intervention. We already talked about uh, reports being uh, uh, purely qualitative. I also want, if you get time for you to report this, uh, uh, to, to, to read this report called The Materiality of Human Capital to Corporate Financial Performance. Uh, uh, this report is very good, probably one of its kind. This paper looked at 96 studies looking at the relationship between human resource practices and company performance, especially return on equity, uh, investment, profit margins, and all these issues. So the results show that uh, human resource practices impact business performance. That's the good news. The results show that uh, human resources practice actually impact on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on business performance. The problem, though, is that no comparable data is available to, to show, uh, especially when you look at uh, 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 whether the, this impact, there's no comparable data available for, for people to monitor that. No publicly available data. So the credibility of data is questionable because it's not subject to external audit most of the time as the case in finance. That's why you find that people in finance, they come and produce numbers naturally because it's finance, uh, but they are given much more attention. Finance, sales, operation, production, because they're working with numbers most of the time and they are credible numbers that they can support. The reason why HR sometimes is ignored or not given the due attention that it requires is that because it's because of uh, this lack of uh, uh, presentation of credible data. Just looking at that same study, what they found is that uh, training, for example, training, uh, the financial impact, uh, 22%, 22 of the studies had financial positive financial impact or impacted on the financial performance of the organization. Uh, and eight of them were mixed, and five had no impact, and one had a negative impact. Then HR policies, there were 56 studies, 45 of those were positive, and nine of those were mixed, which means there was no, not clear whether the, the impact on financial performance or not, and two, none, and zero is negative. And you can see the total there. So that shows you to some extent that HR, if done well, can actually positively impact on the performance uh, uh, of the business. Uh, so early research, if you look at it, it's just focused on looking at the HR practices uh, versus company performance or what they call HR bundles versus company performance or what they refer to as high performance work systems uh, versus uh, company performance. And those studies are indicating that. Core relations have been found between uh, HR practice and firm performance. This is exactly what I was presenting to you there when I said positive. 
The challenge though is causality. And I want you to, to pay attention to this. The challenge is causality. Because uh, basically meaning that uh, if uh, you put an inter HR intervention or a policy and things change in business-wise, is, does it mean that uh, HR intervention is causing the change in business outcomes? Some researchers have now suggested that uh, better training and HR posts may follow from superior financial performance rather than caused by it. And you need to think about that. Generally, if you have noticed across the board, companies that tend to do well, you've got better policies, because they've got the financial muscles to put those policies together. You just look around at face value. Okay, so the challenge then is if a company is doing very well and it's in line with their HR policies that are also best practice, does it mean the best practice HR policies are causing financial, uh, better financial performance? It's too questionable, uh, but a lot of debate uh, there. So, so the question then is, uh, uh, do, uh, uh, do such policies improve financial performance directly or only if they are adopted in conjunction with other steps such as superior business strategy, uh, which I totally agree because I don't think a good HR policies or practice will uh, explain all the variation that you find in company performance. Then training, for example, although the evidence strongly suggestive of a payoff to companies, researchers continue to debate exactly how it occurs. For example, uh, if you have trained people, are you seeing any better value coming out of that? The general view, though, is that training in the employee knowledge, skills, and abilities, that is no doubt, which improves other outcomes like quality, customer service, and customer satisfaction, and productivity, and, 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 and ultimately leading to profitability and, and, and sales. The challenge, though, is compounded by the general nature of our, much of the training. If you look at research, you show, it shows that 60 to 70% of the training offered by employers is generic. Uh, it's not targeted at any particular specific problem that is impacting on the performance of the business. So someone sees someone uh, who is uh, running a, a supervisor development training program, they also go in there and say, John and Sam and Melinda, you need to go on this particular training with no particular business uh, uh, problem that they're trying to address. Such kind of training is actually a waste of money. And also consider this fact that, that roughly 90% of what people learn in any training format is lost within three months. Uh, okay. Especially if they are not given the, uh, the, the opportunity to, to practice what is called training decay. So you can imagine you go and you send people for training, you don't give them an opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to practice. E effectively, within 30 days, you will have wasted your money because that will be lost. So the payoff for training for many companies is very difficult to quantify. I'm sure you will testify to that. And you look at the common metrics that are used in training hours, uh, training hours per employee, which many people report on, training cost per employee. The assumption in, in reporting these, uh, these, these, these indicators is that uh, we are basing your training on proper business-driven training needs. If that is not the case, it's again, again a waste of money. Uh, so, Start to show that there is a relation between these and performance, which is training or HR bundles, uh, and how it works, it's something else in terms of the connection. So the starting point in preparing your report is your organization's people strategy or HR strategy. Many people do not have an HR strategy at all uh, to support the business strategy. They work they basically living from hand to mouth, if we put it in terms of food. They don't have, they wait for the problems to emerge, then they deal with those problems as they're emerging. Why don't you put a blueprint in terms of your one year, two year uh, uh, HR strategy that can drive the performance of the business? Many businesses don't have that. And how does this relate to the business strategy? Because the HR strategy is derived from the business strategy. And how is it, this, it delivered? Naturally between your intervention in terms of policy and practice, and you can then assess uh, its impact. Investors recommend that you focus on the following. This, this is one stakeholder. They recommend that you focus on the following indicators as you are reporting. The size and composition of your workforce uh, is crucial for investors. They want to know the size and composition of your workforce, age, uh, uh, retirement, debt, and, and issues like that are important for them. Retention and motivation. They want to look at the trend in terms of your retention of your staff or staff motivation, uh, staff, uh, staff turnover, sorry, and motivation largely uh, coming through employee engagement. The skills and competence necessary for business to succeed and, uh, and the training to achieve these must also be reported. Remuneration and fair employment practices, leadership and succession planning, for example, how many roles have got a successor or uh, at least a successor, how many of the key roles have got a successor uh, within your organization and how many of those successors are ready as we speak today. 
those are some of the areas that we may want to, to focus on, but we're going to go deeper into some of the, the, the more valuable uh, ways of uh, putting it. So investors re recommend that you focus on, but the issue that is most preoccupied the researchers is how to ascertain the cause and effect, which we've talked about. The question is whether superior HR policy lead to better corporate financial outcomes or whether companies that perform better in financial terms adopt such policies, perhaps because they can better afford them. Those are some of the challenges that have been expressed by the investors. Okay, so that's very important. Another key question, do effective HR practice drive positive financial results or do positive financial results is the same, the same issue? A study by Watson, uh, Charles Watson argued that its, its findings were not conclusive. The study demonstrated that HR practices are strongly related to future performance, but they are also strongly related to past performance, suggesting a, a caution among both academics and practitioners in making any causal inter inferences. So before you conclude and say this causes this, you need to be extremely careful how you interpret that kind of information. Uh, the other key question is how effective is our human capital management indicators? How do these relate to key business and management processes? That's what we want to, uh, to look at. So the key lesson to take from the attempts to come up with a reporting framework for HR is that it is not possible to arrive at a single set of measures that are appropriate to all, even to the extent that one organization set of key performance indicators could be completely irrelevant to another organization. I think I had already highlighted this particular point. Don't take someone's other indicators and just report those. Let's just look at some of the additional information. This is just a bit of background so that when we go to some of the indicators, you can then understand. Uh, HR practice work, the challenge for most professionals is how. So if you look at a start by Bloom and Van Rien, uh, they found that measures of management practice are related to productivity and profitability. McKinsey did a study in 2007, and they found that study is readily available. I've, I've written about it. It's a very interesting study where they found that the quality of management or management practices tend to uh, lead to better productivity with the multinationals outperforming local businesses in relation to this. And they did comprehensive data analysis of actual performance profitability and other performance indicators. And that study, you must look at it. Then another one by Green, there is a relationship between skills and product sophistication, the level of skills that people have in an organization uh, lead basically to innovation in terms of product sophistication. When you find that a company is producing a sophisticated product that people want to buy, for example, Apple and others that are producing iPhones, you will probably notice that the level of skills that they have is also superior. There is also a relationship between training and labor productivity uh, from a study that was done in 2002, in 2000, year 2000. And then uh, Aslid and Becker, I'm sure you would know about these two individuals. Uh, they did, they are more, more mathematical though, but they did find out that one standard deviation shift in the high performance work practice index is associated with 40,000 increase in shareholder value per employee. This is just to support that uh, you can actually be able to report and find value in HR practices. So when you are reporting, there are three levels of reporting, what you call operational analysis. Uh, uh, when you are reporting it to operational analysis, you are basically saying to people for your information or so what level, descriptive level. Uh, for example, if you tell the company that, uh, or in your report is that our turnover for this month was 6%, or our turnover for this month was 20%, uh, that is basically operational, it means nothing. Uh, people can say, oh, so, okay, interesting, then they move on. Uh, it's not very it's not very useful for anyone especially at board level this may be useful to someone who is new in hr or someone who is there is nothing to do with how the business performs but for someone who wants to make a decision about how a business should be performing surely just indicating that uh, a salary uh, turnover has moved to uh, to six uh, six percent means nothing then there's also basic insights this data is manipulated eg through correlations to get to, sorry, to generate some basic insights. The much higher one is uh, uh, the insights driving a business performance. Uh, and uh, you don't necessarily have to start at level three. You can start at level one and do it properly with a bit of refinement. And that would help you in terms of how you, you are running your business. Okay, so at operational level, which is the so what level or for your information level, data typically is reported at this uh, level include headcount, absenteeism, uh, staff turnover, salary changes, employee engagement, disciplinary and grievance, records, leave liability, staff costs, and most of the time without context. Okay? They are not compared to anything. They are without context. You are not comparing to previous quarter. You are not comparing to previous year. 
uh, same period last year. So it's just saying our absenteeism, we had 800 days of absenteeism. Our head count is, uh, is now is, uh, 300. Uh, our salary changes, our salaries changed by 2%. Employee engagement is 80%. That kind of reporting is basically the so what level. Because you are not telling us anything. Uh, you are just giving us information. Uh, and that, that is what we normally find in most of the reports that you find the HR people presenting. If you look at the ISO standard on HR reporting, they cover the following areas. Compliance and ethics, much higher now uh, because of issues that are happening. This is, could be in relation to COVID or basically to do with the sustainability or the millennium uh, uh, goals. Then costs, diversity, leadership, organizational culture, organizational health, safety and well-being, productivity, recruitment, mobility and turnover, skills and capabilities, succession planning, workforce availability, this is what is recommended by the ISO standards. And you can get a copy, you have to buy, unless you have got someone who has it, uh, to come get a copy of this, and you may read, they've got all the things that you require, including the formulas, in terms of how you can do, you can actually calculate these things and how to present them. Uh, those are some of the standards there. Uh, then I will not really, in terms of data uh, that you normally find, you find what is called categorical data, which represents basically naming, for example, gender, Male and female is categorical data. Continuous variable like age, salaries, they uh, obviously require different presentation. Uh, that we normally, when you go into a workshop, we go deeper into, uh, into that. But what is more important for you as HR people, the best graphs for data are bar and line graphs. That's what, uh, this is, you need to take note of this. The best graphs uh, for HR data are line and bar graphs. They allow tracking of changes over time never report any HR data without comparing either to the previous period or comparing it to a benchmark. Otherwise, it means nothing uh, to the people that are looking at that information. So if you have been reporting your information, straight figures, absolute figures, with no comparison to anything, they are not adding any value. We are just giving them information. Your graph must always focus attention on the message you are trying to communicate. If you are presenting anything in the form of a graph, the title must be it must not be generic. It must be communicating the points you want. Okay, uh, as I will show you some of the graphs that I, that I, that, I, that I have uh, later on. Then exploratory analysis: what you do to understand the data and figure out what might be not worth uh, in the data. What do you want your audience to know as you are presenting your information? And this cuts across everything that you present in the board report. What do you want the board to know? Uh, and be clear. Uh, 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 about how you want the audience to act. Yes, they have known that the turnover is 6%. So what? What do you want them to do? There's no point in going to present to the board something that you don't want them to, uh, to act on, uh, especially at that high level. If there's no problem and there are no issues that you want to, the board to pay attention to, there's no need for you to then take that data to them. Because that's why, because once they get to a stage where they say, this person reports rubbish and uh, there's no value in it, you have already lost it. Uh, and that credibility is very difficult to gain. Uh, uh, you must use the data to help you make a point and get some traction from the, from the board. What, uh, which means the action, how do you need your audience to know and do? Why should they care about what you are saying? All this must be answered in your board report. Uh, should, uh, you should always want your audience to know or do something which you have already indicated. If you can't articulate it, you should revisit whether you need to communicate it to the board in the first place. If you can't articulate uh, uh, clearly and, uh, and what action you want them to take, uh, you must ask yourself, do I need to report it on it? Uh, you must not report because it has been a tradition. Then you must also suggest possible remedial action to identify the issues. For example, staff turnover. Let me give you another simple one, which most organizations face, now, especially now because of the, uh, how competitive the market is in terms of uh, in terms of retaining and attracting staff. You are hiring the first quarter, you offered uh, 20 employees uh, uh, offer letters and, uh, 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 and the 18 of them rejected your offer letters, basically. Okay, which means definitely about 80% of the people that you gave offer letters rejected your offer letter. Uh, 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 uh. So what, what we want to highlight to the board is that we've got a problem that we, we are failing to attract uh, the right people because of our low remuneration. Most of them have cited low remuneration. I would want the board to take a holistic picture and review our salary so that we become more competitive. Uh, for example, we are actually operating at 25% of the market when the median is at this level. 
no one will, everyone will pay attention to that kind of analysis. Obviously, I could go deeper into that kind of analysis to make sure that whoever reads the report can, uh, can, can look at that. And also, here is another trick that you must do. The other trick is that, yes, your report can be 20 pages. Do an executive summary of two pages of all the key issues. The people can then go into detail into, into the main report. But all the key issues where you want the board to act must be in the executive summary of that particular report. Because they have no time to read those reports. That's why you find people come to your, to your board reports, uh, to your, to your, to, to, when they come to your board to read your board report. In the majority of cases, you find that the HR report probably is not read. Sometimes you find that uh, when they get to the HR report, they are already on their phones and they are moving around in the room and talking because they don't pay attention to, uh, to the report at all. So these are issues that you need to, to take into, into consideration. Uh, and if you hear your board saying, this is interesting, and move on, it means the report is not being done properly. Or some people say, so what? The so what it can be communicated in a variety of ways. When there is no action taken, when people take long to action your issues as an HR person, it's all pointing to how you are presenting your information uh, to the board. So it's really sometimes not necessarily about, it. I can tell you now that if the report, if the report is prepared to the right standard, it will be the most read report in your, in, your, in your committees, probably the most read reports in any board meeting that you attend uh, because of how it's presented, this information is presented. For example, this is just a storyboard uh, about something else that I, I picked. Uh, for example, uh, look at this uh, issue uh, that is here. The issue is kids have bad attitudes about science. That's the issue. That's, that's basically how you present your issues. Uh, kids have bad attitudes about science. Then the next issue, demonstrate the issue. Okay, so how do I demonstrate this issue? I show student assignments grades over a course of a year. Okay, uh, probably a graph showing that the kids' uh, performance in science is going down. Okay, then any ideas for overcoming the issue, including a pilot program? How are you going to address the issue? Don't go to the board and expect the board to give you answers. You must go to the board with your own answers. Here is a proposed solution, because you want the board to approve your action and be able to support it so that it can get the funding if it needs funding, so that it can get the support that it needs if it needs the support. Then describe the pilot program goals. Then the most important part, which does not require science, most people think it's science, is that show the before and after survey. If you are going to do a survey, before and after to demonstrate the success of a problem, of a program. You just look at the before and after. Then the pilot was success, let's expand and we move on, as I will show you in some of the uh, things that I'm going to look at. Uh, and also remember, when you are prepare, preparing to present your report to the board, not every number needs a graph. You don't necessarily have to put a graph for every number. Some things can be communicated in a sentence and they very well. If you have two figures to report, there's no need for you to put a graph, for example. E.g., of the 150 people who left the organization for only last year, 70% were male. You don't necessarily need a graph for that. Okay, and there are many other things where you can communicate information very clearly. For example, if we were to reverse this and say, of the 150 people who left the organization for only last year, 70% of them were females. Uh, and even if it's not really incisive to the extent that you would want, someone reading that in the executive summary is likely to see, put question marks and say, why are we losing female employees? But I also expect that when you go to the board, you will have already found the answers already so that the board does not ask you, why are you losing female employees? Then the other point is that when you're using tables, use them in written submissions and not in a live presentation. Don't use tables in a live presentation. Uh, 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 and also, uh, if, if, if don't behave on borders uh, uh, if you are presenting that. Okay, the other point to take note is that I've already highlighted this point. Use line graphs when dealing with continuous variables, please. Uh, remove clutter from your visuals. Use colors sparingly, no more than two colors in any graph. No more than two colors in any graph that you're going to put. Uh, otherwise, you take away the attention that is required for that particular uh, 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 graph. So if you, if you go back to the stage one where we're talking about best case data is manipulated through correlations, uh, and uh, then you get your guided interventions, checking the relation between employee engagement and business performance and reporting to the board. Imagine the value that you create if you have been doing employee engagement or employee satisfaction surveys for the past 10 years, you've got that data, you've got company performance uh, for the past 10 years, you've got that data. Why are you not looking at the relationship? Is there any relationship between overall employee engagement and each of the dimensions in terms of organizational performance? 
Okay, what insights can come from there? Uh, uh, what are you recommending to the board, for example, in relation to, uh, to, to that? So the key issue is HR data uh, can help inform immediate and future business decisions. Okay, uh, you must then be able to identify those HR drivers that are impacting on business performance uh, uh, so that you can enable better decision making. Let's look at the journey going through this road. Start measurement and reporting if you are not reporting. Do not wait for perfect data. I know in, in most HR people don't have an HR system, but Excel can do the wonders if you really know how to use Excel, even in terms of holding that information. But also remember, there are free databases for HR, free HR software, just for, for handling basic information, even employee engagement, employee records, against each employee, that information is available. Uh, probably HR is the less digitalized of all the functions in any organization, because largely it's given less priority. Uh, prepare to answer questions as you share your insights. You don't go to the board and they start asking questions and you look blank. Uh, and sometimes it's actually better to present to your own HR team in advance and they'll give you some pointers on how you can do th this. Okay? So, the, in terms of report formats, uh, we do in the workshop, we do experiment with a number of report formats depending on the level of sophistication that the HR team has. Uh, interpret the information for the audit. Don't assume they will spot what you think is obvious. So it's very important uh, for you to be able to do that. And also have a very good relationship with people in finance, marketing, production, who actually have got these performance indicators for the business readily available. And uh, you should actually be getting this information even as, as HR, so that you can actually connect uh, HR performance indicators to these particular uh, indicators, okay? Um, then uh, the ultimate goal in this journey is to assess the impact of HR uh, on business uh, performance through your HR intervention. What are those practices and innovations that are showing a consistent relation with the business outcomes? Prioritize those and invest in those. Well, sometimes we are all over the show and we are putting uh, uh, our priority in many activities and interventions without prioritizing. And some of the interventions that we, we, we prioritize have no impact on business performance. For example, one of the key things that you can do to your business in terms of helping it grow, uh, succeed, is to get the top best talent that you can through proper recruitment, through a proper remuneration uh, uh, strategy or, or a model. Those two can give the organization a head start if you do them all. Majority of the cases, recruitment is done haphazardly, so biased and things like that. Majority of the cases, uh, pay is administered so haphazardly, no impact. And those are some of the key priorities in terms of business impact. And another example that I gave earlier on is that if employee engagement is related to sales volume, as an example, what interventions should you work on to ensure that we get the maximum employee engagement? Because that's where you can push. And once employee engagement goes up, you know it's actually coming from employee engagement. And you can show this to, to other executives and the board and say, look, our employee engagement has got a relationship with the, with the, with the sales volume. In order for us to drive sales, this is what we need to do uh, uh, coming from an HR point of view. Okay, so at the operational level, I think I have already uh, covered this. Show numbers versus similar organizations or national benchmarks. We have tried to produce some of the benchmarks, especially on turnover by sector. We have shared it uh, and we've never, but even where we have shared it in the WhatsApp groups, some people still call and say, where is that figure? Can you, do you have figures on, uh, on employee uh, staff turnover? We do. Uh, we did another research where we gave people the, the ratio of HR staff to, to overall headcount. Uh, again, people just still don't use that information. This is local information available and you produce those reports, but people they rarely use that information. Uh, then um, I'll show you sample analysis on, the, on, the, on these ones, the correlation uh, in terms of uh, what, we, what you need to do. Then on the inside driving performance, this is basically more predictive. I would not suggest you go to this level before, before you understand the other levels that we've talked about. You need to progress uh, to a higher level slowly and start showing the value. And once you start getting these the levels of analysis, even when opportunities arise, especially for those that are senior, you definitely are going to compete uh, competitive because you know what drives the business. Uh, even for CEO roles, you know what drives the business. You should be able to compete with anyone. Uh, 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 so at the insights level, you're basically trying to predict, uh, to identify those metrics that, that, those metrics that predict business performance and integrate those into your, into your, into your strategy. Uh, almost 100% of all the HR reports that I have seen all report historical data, what happened last quarter. 
uh, move more towards more forecasting. You've got data already in your organization. You can forecast a lot of things. Excel has got uh, very good forecasting uh, uh, parameters for those that are not statistically complicated or sophisticated. Uh, you can use uh, this data to predict what problems you are likely to face as an organization from an HR point of view. And already, if you already know the impact of these problems on performance, it's much easier to, to then uh, uh, identify solution. You can also report on dollar cost of not doing any certain, certain interventions. Sometimes it's not necessarily just putting an intervention. And if you get resistance from the board, you must be able to quantify if you strongly believe your intervention was going to help the organization. You must quantify the cost of not doing that intervention and track it and go back and report to the board and say, look, we did not increase our salaries uh, 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 by this much amount and it's related to our turnover from our research uh, and, uh, and look at where we are now and how much it's costing us in terms of replacement, how much is costing us in terms of lost productivity. Those things can be done very simply. And again, as indicated, you don't necessarily need to do them yourself. I don't expect an organization that employs more than 100 people now not to have someone who has got a statistical background or someone who is good quantitatively to do this kind of analysis. Every department must have this kind of person so that uh, this person can then help them. So the challenge for these, frame all your metrics, what decision must be made, what is the cost of doing nothing, who must act and by when, what is your recommended cost of action in everything that you present to, to the board. Uh, 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 the issue of historical, I think I've already covered. So let's look at what Dr. John Sullivan recommends in terms of HR interventions. I know there are a lot of uh, organizations now running a number of interventions, job evaluation, team building, uh, many other programs that we are doing, uh, training of staff and things like that. Here is what he suggests. He says, use a split sample or a control group. Uh, what it basically means in simple terms is that if you've got salespeople uh, and you want to train them on sales, you think there's a problem, you need to randomly pick uh, one group and call it group A and train them and don't train the other group. Then compare their sales over a short period of time and see if there are any changes. And if there are changes, present them in a the form of a graph and present it to the board. No one will, they will definitely pay attention uh, to that. And say, for those, I will show you a graph that I did in relation to, to that. So this is basically a before and after contrast that you are doing. Uh, if you can demonstrate correlation, which is basically a relationship without necessarily going into a correlation analysis. Uh, and I will show you a graph uh, that shows that. Uh, then the results are after implementing show that employee performance is high immediately after a program is implemented. Let me tell you, for example, one of the things that uh, is prevalent in many organizations. People go to the board and say, look, we want a salary increase of so much, so much percent. But they can't show what, what is the impact, what will be the impact on the business in terms of performance. Do you, do you mean that if you give people an extra 20%, the business will do better? What is it? The, or if there's no direct relationship, uh, you may link it to turnover and turnover and its consequence on, on ultimate uh, on, on productivity and subsequent common performance. Those are the issues that you must outline. You don't just go to the board and say, we need a 30% increase because the market is paying that. You must go there and say, we will need this percentage of increase for these reasons and the impact on the business is this and this. Uh, not necessarily just uh, 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 this one, I think I've already highlighted in terms of the, the sales side. Recruitment, for example. Demonstrate that newly hired workers produce more than average workers. If you have introduced a new recruitment mo model, uh, you must demonstrate that. That the people that I, we have hired using this particular tool are actually better performers compared to this particular tool. And you don't need uh, uh, to be a statistician to, to do that. With the very basic, with the very basic uh, uh, information, you, you can actually be able to, 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 do, to, to, to show the impact of Asia on actual business performance. Compensation, are you able to show that the salary increase you gave result in a significant lift in organizational performance? Can you do that? That the things that you have given actually lifted the company performance. Provide the evidence. Is the percentage of employees pay that is tied to performance increases, does that output, does output and productivity also increase? Are your highest paid employees producing more than the average performer? Do you do this kind of analysis? If you are not doing it, why? Don't you think your board will be interested in, in, that kind of in, in that kind of information? For example, employee relations. Check for changes in key indicators after your workers' committee or workers' council training. Compare before and after. Are grievances going down? Are additional cases going down? And if they are going up after your training, after training managers, all the line managers on how to handle disciplinary processes and the, the, the grievance process, uh, 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 grievances or disciplinary cases keep going up, what does that mean in the context of your business? 
Okay, so these are all issues that you need uh, to look at. Performance. So you must show that key business indicators improved after staff we went, went through performance management training. Sometimes you train everyone in mass, there is no indicator of success or failure. You must go deeper and show this relationship by department. Okay, check for changes in revenue, cost reduction, new business, total output changes compared to period before staff were trained. These are all issues that you can do. With, and some of them don't need a statistician. You can do that on your own. Can you demonstrate change in key indicators after introduction of wellness programs? I know a lot of you have introduced wellness programs. And uh, most of the time when people report on this, they just say people are happy. Surely the business is not, is not run on being happy. Okay? What, are, what happens to unplanned absenteeism after the program, for example? And you must, this must be derived from the key objectives of any intervention that we have. And before you introduce that, it must have quantitative objectives that say, before this is what is happening, after this is what we are seeing uh, in the organization. Let's just look at a few graphs uh, as we get to the end, and I will so, also show you a sample report. So this is the trends in employee engagement, customer satisfaction, for example, uh, from January to, to, to August, uh, for a company that have got uh, what I call the uh, uh, live uh, employee engagement uh, tools, where they actually collect this information on a daily basis. Uh, 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 and some collect monthly. So you can see there some form of relationship between employee engagement and customer satisfaction. And even from research, this is well established. Okay, if you can go and report this to the board and say, look, uh, if we don't, like for example, if you look at the period of August, uh, for example, uh, employee engagement went down, customer satisfaction went down. And who would not want to have that? And then you go and say, look, in order for us to improve our employee engagement, here are the five key strategies that I recommend the board to support me on. One, two, three, four, five. That's how we do it. Okay? And you have presented that kind of information. Then assessing the impact of training after, after training a randomly selected group from a group of sales staff. Uh, for example, you can see uh, team B uh, not trained. Then team A is the one that has been trained. Who would not want to get that kind of benefit from, uh, especially as you start from July? That was after the training. Okay? Uh, 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 the, after the, the training was in January, and we are looking at sales volume. Uh, per, uh, this is average per, for the people who have been trained. Then the other one, Team B, is average for the people who have not been trained. There's a huge gap, as, as especially as we go forward. There's a huge gap in difference. So if I were someone and they go to the board and they request, look, I need another extra thirty thousand US dollars to train all our sixty uh, 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 sales staff in this methodology or in this new sales techniques. Uh, that we, uh, we that we we train the uh, group A, you will get the support immediately from the board. There is no board that will not support this kind of thing unless they are insane, uh, because they are showing them the value. And every business wants to succeed. If you can help anyone to succeed, they will support you. Then let's look at headcount trends versus sales volume. Okay, you are a company, uh, and you got your so you are selling whatever product, and you got a sales volume figures, uh, and you look there the sales volume figures. Uh, for your organization, you can see up and down, up and down uh, for that period. But when you look at your so your head count uh, is up. For example, if you look at the uh, on your right, sales are going down, but the head count remains the same. What does that mean to you? And uh, what are you going to report to the board? Which means, to some extent, to some extent, not entirely true, uh, but to some extent, uh, it means that whether we increase the head count or not. Uh, sales are not going to, uh, to, to increase. For example, someone can come and say uh, uh, the sales volumes are going down, we need to hire more people. Okay, If you are the HR director and HR uh, manager, are you going to approve such kind of, 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 of hiring when the data is showing that the, an increase in, 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 in headcount does not add to, uh, to, 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 to sales volume increase? But there could be more deeper issues than this. For example, it could be actually be an issue of the quality of the people that we have, not necessarily the headcount. So this lack of relationship could be a reflection of the quality of the people that we have had, where they are probably not contributing anything, they don't have the right skills to be able to drive that, or it could just be a lack of skill. Uh, these are all issues that you must dig deeper into. So when you are doing the analysis, in the actual training, we actually dig deeper into how you go into that. Like I indicated, this is just an introductory uh, session that we are having here. Reduction of absenteeism, days after wellness program, you are reporting to the board, say, I came to you as a board in, 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 in February, January, February, March, and requested that you give me money to go on a wellness program because our absenteeism and planned absenteeism was going up. 
uh, significantly and they were concerned. I showed you the data uh, for that period, February to March. Uh, at the peak in April, we were at 954, uh, and you allowed me between April and May to implement a wellness program, an intensive wellness program. And now for the month of May, we are now at 235 in terms of uh, days lost to unplanned absenteeism. And this, you are showing them even at the end of the year when you are preparing your annual report, where you are saying, look where we started at a peak of 954 uh, lost days. This is, you could then also plot it in dollars. How much money did you lose at the peak in April versus what you are losing now in October It's 22 days. These are all issues that you can go deeper into. This graph, I can produce three more graphs just going deeper, looking at the figures uh, and going deeper, probably by function and all these things. But when you go to the board, you need to have a summarized version. Uh, but for operational purposes, where you are reporting to other executives, you may want to go deeper and, and, uh, and bundle this kind of uh, uh, graph. Then average compare ratio versus trends and stuff turnover. The board has not been believing you in what you are doing in terms of uh, uh, saying let's 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 pay competitive salaries in terms of the market and you want to show them uh, and say look let's look at our graph i've been coming to you every month uh, now we are in, in, in november uh, and uh, i want to show you the impact and the disaster that we have managed over the course of the last 10 months or so uh, you can see the average compa ratio okay uh, average compa ratio there Staff turnover is also going down. The comparison is basically how competitive your salaries are versus the market. And you can see your average comparison is above 100, which means you are paying slightly above the, the market. And your, comp your, your, your turnover also started going, started going down for, those, for that same particular period. Who would not want to hear this kind of information? It's different from someone who just goes there and says we need a 30% increase. For what? What is the purpose? What is the trigger? And all those things. And you can't just go there and say people are unhappy. If you want to talk about people being unhappy, they must then go and present your employee engagement figures uh, to, 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 to the board. So that's basically that. Let me, before I, I open up for questions, let me show you if I can uh, 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 get a sample report and um, some of the things, but it's a basic one. Uh, I will not show you here the, the more uh, uh, detailed report. So this is for, uh, this is a report that we prepared a human capital report for this is for the board for a common called meridian uh, you start obviously the summer this one is an annual one uh, you give a background most of the hr reports have no background to either economic situation or uh, the company context in terms of business performance they go just go and say absenteeism here this one there this one there with no context to the business because even hr committee members remember when you go to the hr committee people the board would uh, would have not met at that time so you want to give them some form of context in terms of the economy, in terms of the key challenges uh, in the market, for example, what is happening in the HR market? That's what you start with there. Uh, then uh, uh, operating environment, you can, uh, look, this is, look at this. This whole page has nothing to really to do with HR per se. This whole page, okay? It's really looking at the operating environment. Growth in terms of our brands, okay? Uh, sales distribution by channel, you can see there. Uh, and who would not be interested to get this kind of snapshot as a board member, okay? And, and this gives the context. It's actually giving the board members the context to be able to appreciate what you're going to present, okay? That's where you start there. Then two, uh, after operating environment, you can then go to look at, it's two business performance there. Then you look at the human capital strategy must all be there. What is your strategy? One page, not more than one page. What is your human capital strategy? What are the key facets, as you can see from here, okay? But when your board members, who are HR committee members, are now interpreting your report, they have got a context already because they've put a business context to it, okay? Then, uh, so uh, align the organizational structure, human capital strategy, the workforce optimization and development. We are going to optimize staff to free up resources for new business. We are going to upskill staff to close skills gap given the corporate strategy. We are going to recruit externally as the last resort where internal recruitment cannot close the identified gaps. Retention, we are going to remodel staff compensation to divide, drive individual performance, uh, retain key talent through career progression, align the organization's culture of the strategy and, car and current workforce uh, uh, to drive engagement, implement off-boarding strategy to facilitate the re-engagement of key talent. Innovation, promote inclusivity and equality, which in turn promotes innovation, set innovation KPIs in performance management toolkit, promote a learning culture, that's, that is just an example, but obviously your own strategy will be speaking to your own issues. 
Okay, staff cost in management and employee productivity. Look here, uh, uh, that uh, uh, RAG rag is just standing for red, amber, green category. Is just uh, an indicator of red, green, uh, red, uh, amber, and green. You can see staff costs, staff cost per employee, staff cost uh, to revenue, staff cost to OPEX, uh, 2019. Uh, uh, then you have your target there, uh, the amber, 2018, 2017. This, but remember, this is an example. Then also the business is, is in the red on all the staff cost management indicators. Staff cost has continued to rise above the target between 2017 and 2019 as labor replaced machines resulting in excessive overtime and other labor costs. Production sites have become labor intensive. Staff cost ratios remain high above target. This is explained by declining revenues and output as the business slowly loses its market share to new FMG sector. This is what, is what it did for a commercial a kind of retail, commercial kind of sector. Who would not want to hear that kind of information? Look at the language that we are using there. Employee productivity. The net promoter score shows that the business core customers are largely passive. While they are satisfied with the Meridian brand, they are easily swayed by competitive offerings. This is characteristic of millennials who now constitute the bulk of the Meridian customers. Okay, you look at that. Again, we are on the red. Other staff cost drivers, training costs, a training costs per employee, a a re recruitment costs, all these but when you go into a deeper report, you can then look at these other staff cost drivers and their impact, their relationship with the other costs that, that you uh, yeah. Recruitment cost analysis. While the recruitment cost for 2019 is within budget, a breakdown of the cost reveals that the major driver of this cost is replacement cost for staff who left the business. Who would not want to do that? So replacement costs are at 76% of all the staff costs. The replacement costs constitute 76%. Don't you think they will pay attention? If you present it like this. Okay, then let's look at the outlook. The business has endeavored to get staff costs under control by developing staff, recruiting internally, and only filling vacancies with external accounts where there is no capacity to develop the skills internally. Meridian corporate strategy requires extensive development of staff as the business enters the digital and small scale trade, uh, uh, small trade deals. This implies that employee development will contribute significantly to staff costs. Okay, you go the diversity, which is a key issue. Okay. Uh, you are reporting on diversity there. Hmm? Female versus male, and you go deeper. And this is still at the basic. We have not even gone to where I was talking about, where we are looking at relationships, major insight. But even at the basic level, someone will pay attention if you present your report, your report like this. Okay, staff turnover, a voluntary turnover, involuntary turnover, notes. The business continues to experience high staff attrition exceeding global a benchmark of 5%. Most people don't know that the global benchmark for staff turnover is 5%. The business extended its voluntary uh, to involuntary turnover target, uh, exceeded, sorry, uh, 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 target of 50% and 72% employees resign, which reduces the business ability to manage poor performance out of Meridian. 65% of the staff who resigned were regrettable losses to the business, or all those things, okay? You go by employee category and in further analysis, why are general staff leaving better pay? Other staff better pay. Specialist workout and better pay. Junior management workout, which means they are actually doing proper exit interviews. Middle management, career progression, workout. Senior management, career progression. Executives, personal reasons. You understand? Uh, you, 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 then you put your notes below there. You go recruitment, okay, replacement and things like that. The notes there, uh, employee distribution by age. If it matters to your business, it may not matter to your business. That's why I said you can only produce this kind of report if, 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 if it matters to your business and your strategy. If it doesn't, don't. Skills based and staff development, look here. Kanban and wide potential analysis, this is what we have. Okay? 10% uh, of the people have no future, they have no potential. 10.9% of our staff and are below expectation in terms of performance. Uh, and is that not an interesting figure for the board? It is. Uh, talent differentiation matrix, uh, all these things are key to your business, okay? Recruitment of new vacancies, these are the new vacancies, expected impact to the business. Some people just recruit, no impact, they go and request for new people, no impact, as HR, you must then be able to present. Why are we hiring 10 more sales people? What is the impact expected? And why do you believe there is an impact? Have you established that there is a relationship between headcount and sales? All those issues, or you're opening a new territory where you're going as a business and you need new salespeople there. These are all issues that you, you need to look at. Employee, engage, employee compensation, okay? 
So uh, employee compensation, you can see here your compa ratio. Uh, and where are we having the problem with general staff, for example, uh, and uh, performance expectations for the same group? Because remember here, we are actually looking at external equity. We're also looking at the performance. We're also looking at the tenure. We're also looking at the gender and the, the amber ones, the red ones, that's where problems are. Okay, that's where problems are. And for example, when you look at the below performance in terms of below, ex, below expectation, exceed the expectation, what is the variance and things like that. Those are issues that you need. Salary review, review proposal, staff turnover is expected to rise even higher as other organizations continue to move into compete. Further, uh, furthermore, when staff turnover is analyzed in conjunction with employee engagement, it is revealed that better pay curb staff turnover and help employee engagement. We are now going deeper into, into the meat of the, of the thing. Then employee engagement, okay, you are actually categorizing by dimensions uh, and also by level, executives, senior, middle management, junior specialists, and the but the problematic areas, you can see them on compensation. For example, we've got a problem on middle managers, junior managers, specialist staff, then general staff. Uh, and, but we are much better on senior management and uh, probably much better on executives. These are issues. Employee engagement action areas, okay? What are we going to do about the leadership and culture? Department, uh, CEO's office, score is 50. Industry benchmark is 69. The variance is 28. There's a need for leadership to regularly engage with employees. Look at the action plans, the way they are presented. Who would not want to read this? Okay. Engagement areas, much more detailed action plans. This is we are sharing with your board. Couch and change management, audit, uh, all these issues. Uh, absenteeism analysis. You can see there. Uh, uh, that's the absenteeism analysis for the, all the years there. Uh, then employee by level and things like that. Sick leave. You can see absenteeism. A total absenteeism, a total a percentage of total cost. Look at uh, the absenteeism for specialists, 42% of total cost and 21% for senior managers there, total cost and things like that. Look at that. Culture audit and change management proposal. That's the, the thing there. Innovation and productivity, that's another one. Key, key delivery areas and support required from the board. You are now putting it in summary. This is what I require the board to do in order to help me as an, uh, as an HR person in order to drive the business. Staff cost, secure more funds for the training budget for, to upskill, uh, identify the staff, 174, approval training budget, when uh, employee diversity, amendment of the executive appointment criteria to facilitate the appointment of younger employees, approval. Of, look at the, the, the cream that comes out of this kind of report. Okay, thank you. I think that's, uh, that's it. I can take questions. Please just unmute yourself and ask any questions that we have. All right, Memory, are you going to send us a, a link or a copies of this presentation? Yes, it, it was being recorded once it's edited. Let's just say by tomorrow around 10, it should be done or by end of day. Okay, and it will include this uh, Meridian report, right? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Memory. Good afternoon. Kevin? Hello? Hello, memory? Yes, you can carry on. Oh, yeah, uh, this is just to say thank you so much. I mean, the way you've articulated the point. Yes, you can hear me now? Yes. Yes, carry on. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're breaking. We can't hear you. Uh, I, I, I think you can put your comment on the chat uh, because we can't hear you at all. Hello, memory. Yes. Uh, I just want to thank you for your report. Uh, it was quite uh, educative. Thank you. I, I just wish we could have more of these sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Good afternoon, memory. Uh, also, a, also a comment to say, yeah, thank you for the report. Quite informative. Um, the other aspect that you spoke about, really, I think we are seeing it in terms of the return on investment on training and how to, re to present it mm -hmm. either to the board or to senior executives. I think we have been lagging behind most organizations as HR. 
I would give a, an example to say currently we are now in a different mode with this COVID-19. Mm-hmm. For example, people have to have hybrid models of working, mm-hmm. people working from home, some at work. And you see most of the guys, especially digital awareness, yeah, it's quite lagging. So you can actually see the impact and the, and the value that is created when we present to the board the need to have this uh, training and the return on investment on training. Thank you. So thank you for the presentation once again. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Thanks, memory for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I want just to make a small contribution relating to the, the Meridian report. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, what has affected us as HR mostly is unavailability of such data, mm-hmm. which will aid us in making presentations to the board that are quite informative and worth reading. Mm-hmm. So I think with uh, the kind of presentation you've made, I think this will help us in a very big way to try to improve and build up a system which will actually capture this kind of data to be able to make a sound presentation to the board. Thank you. Once again, thanks a lot. Thank you. That's true. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there anyone else with anything? If there's nothing, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, Next week, we will have uh, a presentation, most likely Tuesday, I'll share the link tomorrow. We we'll have a presentation on Zimbabwean salary trends, looking at Africa, Zimbabwe in the context of Africa, and what people are doing in relation to remuneration. So don't miss that one. Uh, it's a very insight. We've been working on that presentation for a while. Uh, we'll be uh, sharing the link uh, to that presentation on Tuesday, uh, same time at 12. Uh, uh, make a date on that uh, uh, particular for that particular presentation. Otherwise, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>